All right, so Angela, thank you so much for participating in our webcast this week. Today we're talking about predictive analytics, uh, more importantly, the analytic mindset that, that one needs to really have to, to be effective in the workplace. So Angela, thank you so much for taking time out your day uh, to have this conversation with us. Um, Thanks for having me. Angela, yeah, absolutely. So Angela, um, let's talk about your, your background. Did you always have an interest in, in analytics? Where did this all come from? It comes from wanting to solve problems. So I have always wanted to solve problems. My mom can tell you a story of when I was about six years old, we had a gopher in our backyard and I mm. spent a lot of time with a pen and paper um, designing the perfect gopher trap so we could capture the gopher and relocate it. Um, mm. Nothing actually ever came of that, but apparently I put a lot of energy into designing the perfect gopher trap. And I think people, we sort of end up who we are as a little person, we just become more of ourselves as we get older. And so I what agree. I've just done over time is learn more tools for how to solve problems or how to look at data, how to break it down and do something with it. But I didn't always know that analytics was the field I wanted to be in. I started off with accounting and I wandered into um, network management with information technology and then did data analysis, and then I discovered predictive analytics. I, I went to a conference, the um, O'Reilly Strata conference mm -hmm. in California, and it was all about big data. And I'm like, what's this big data thing? It was all new. And by that time, I was really good at Excel, and I found that nobody there cared that I was really good at Excel, because Excel yeah. was like the baby step application you use for doing great things with data. So it, it got me curious. Well, if I can't do Excel, then what can I do to get better? And then after being out of college for 20 years, I went back to school and got a master's in predictive analytics. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So a lot of, a lot of professionals are very familiar with um, business intelligence, yeah. right? There's data flowing all throughout our organization. So everyone's kind of familiar with business intelligence and there's different queries that you can run to, to run reports. What's the difference in your, from your perspective, what's the difference between business intelligence and predictive analytics? Okay, well, business intelligence, think of it like an umbrella. And what mm -hmm. we're used to associating with BI would be traditional reports like, here's the amount of money we made month over month, and you get a nice chart that's stacking it as columns or something. Um, those are more of your simpler mathematical computations where yeah something you can do in Excel and it just makes sense to a normal human being typically. Whereas mm -hmm. the predictive analytics side is a lot more complex math and that'll be something with some sort of iterative cycle and it might go searching until it finds the best thing. It's more complicated, but it's still under the framework of BI. So predictive analytics is looking at classifying things as one example. And it's, it's looking for if, if, if certain conditions are true, then the classification is going to go on this side. Or um, it could be regression. So you, you might be looking at what are the, the elements that contribute to something. So if I want to move the needle by this unit, I need to move that unit. It, it helps you to predict what something's going to be like so that you get a block of data, you understand it, and then as you get new data, it gets sorted into what you've set up to help you. It'll give you a prediction of what you was most likely to do under the same conditions. And so even, even preparing for this webcast, me and you had a number of conversations. And um, I think what we arrived at was, we know that there's a lot of tools out there now um, claiming to provide predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. um, but you can actually possess a, a predictive quality that helps you, or a predictive analytic mindset that helps you break down problems. Yes. Right? Remember we were talking about that? So from yes. your experience, what would you describe as an analytic mindset? It's partly that curiosity about breaking something apart and understanding the causation behind things. So here's some situation. Why is it like the way it is? And if I want to change that, what do I do differently? And it's asking questions and just sort of tearing apart the assumptions. Or it's even just acknowledging, oh, I've been making this assumption all of the time. Well, let's take a closer look at that. And is it really the way I think it is? Or does it always have to be that way? Or is there another answer? So that's a huge yeah. part of the analytic mindset. 
Yeah, and I think that's very relevant for, for the change in our community. You know, mostly everyone in there is a practitioner working on enterprise level projects. And you highlighted something, challenging our assumptions. So often we go to work and we support different initiatives, um, but we're operating the same way day to day. So it's important to step back and, and challenge our assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and earlier we were talking about a number of examples of how you know, having an analytic mindset can actually help solve big problems. You were telling me about a case study um, surrounding um, baby mortality rates. Yes. So can you share more about that? Well, we booked the power of habit, which is not a place you would necessarily think to find information about an analytical mindset. But the author is writing about Paul O'Neill, who was working for the government for a, a period of time. And he discovered during his tenure that the United States had a heartbreaking infant mortality rate, which was pretty unusual for as advanced of a country as we were. And he started digging into why were babies dying prematurely. And what he found, well, the babies were dying because a lot of them were born premature. Why were they born prematurely? Well, it turns out they were born prematurely because they had malnourished mothers. Why do they have malnourished mothers? because they, the people weren't, children weren't getting enough information about good nutrition while they were in high school and before they were sexually active. Well, then how do you give children this information mm -hmm. before they become mothers? Well, you need to make sure that their teachers know enough about basic biology. They, they can teach nutrition as part of the high school curriculum. And you back into, well, how do you do that? Well, you make sure that your college courses teach an adequate amount of information in this area so that your future teachers will know enough then to go and teach our future students to have better nutrition. And it actually yeah. makes a difference. Um, at the time the book was published, it was 2012, and the author said that the U.S. infant mortality rate was 68% lower than when Paul O'Neill started digging into this information. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. No, that's a great example of how, you, how to break down a problem to get at, to get at a root cause. You know, um, earlier in preparing for this webcast as well, me and you were talking about another example of after you break down a problem, thinking about network effects mm -hmm. and the, the ability to introduce a problem to a network of people who can collaborate and work together to, to solve um, a problem. The, the, the example we talked about was kind of unfortunate involving you and your husband um, but would you be willing to share that story with, with the community? I think it's a great example of, of how, how you can break down a problem and how to think about interacting with a network of people to, to solve it the right way. Okay. Um, in 2004, um, my husband and I were in an automotive collision that ended up being fatal for the other party, uh, which was pretty awful. And my husband was the driver. I'm the passenger. And for me, it was awful because I could see it coming and I couldn't understand why he started the turn. But I also remember looking, seeing someone was coming, thinking this is going to be a problem, looking away and looking back and going, wait, where are they? And then, oh, there they are. And mm -hmm. for months after the collision, which was one of the worst experiences of our lives, my husband kept asking himself, why did I turn left in front of this person? I never turned left in front of someone. There was someone coming. I should have seen him. Why didn't I see him? And he returned to the intersection and he noticed something he hadn't seen initially, which was that the oncoming road wasn't flat. It actually dipped down a little bit and came back up again. And what must have happened was that when he looked and checked for oncoming traffic, the motorcyclist who was coming at us was in the dip. Now, what that means is that the shape of the oncoming silhouette does not match the shape of what your brain is used to seeing for oncoming traffic that you yield to. It was a different shape, didn't register, he started the turn. And it bothered me that this was something preventable. I mean, if the traffic signal was just changed to be a left turn on an arrow only, you could prevent any further collisions. And I thought, I've got to tell the city, but I also knew you have to tell the right person at the city to get a traffic signal mm -hmm. change. And I had no idea who the right person would be. And I really didn't think I could bear to repeat myself a bunch of times to explain it to a number of different individuals as you get passed around. But I found it on the city's website. And so they actually had a form you could fill out where you could describe um, hazardous traffic intersections. 
and I filled out the form. And I called my husband over and I'm like, please read through what I'm saying, have to be very succinct with it and have to get to the point and convince them without going on and on. And I want to say it accurately because it's his perspective, not mine. We worked together and it was really hard and we were crying by the end of it. We, we got it filled out and I clicked the submit button and then I sent it to the city and I'm like, this is great. And I yeah. heard nothing for like mm -hmm. two to three weeks, just crickets chirping, no response of any kind. But then yeah. I got this email from the city where they're like, we agree with you. We looked back at the, all of the collisions in the year of your collision and the year before. We found that most everybody had the same weather conditions as you, where it was clear, excellent visibility, no precipitation. And we have already changed the traffic signal to become a left on Green Arrow only. And that was in 2005 when they made the change and zero people have died at that intersection since then. Whereas three to four people died the same year of ours. So I'm not sure how many people died the year before, but if you're looking at maybe three people per year dying at that intersection from left turns, you've got dozens of people who are alive today because of a form. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just a form. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I has been figured out the answer and I took the initiative to report it, but someone had to read that report, direct it to the right person. Someone had to decide this was worth investigating, pull up records, look back through two years worth of data to, to see if there was something in common. Someone had to make a decision mm -hmm. and then go out there and change the traffic signal and take the time to respond to me. So there are a lot of different steps in this process. And the cross-functional team working together, trying to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it all really, I think that's, it's a very, very unfortunate situation. But if you look at the structure of how the, the problem was solved, you and your husband work together to supply the information to a cross-functional team who work together um, and, and leverage their talents to, to ultimately you know, save lives. And I remember when we were talking just the other day about if we were to parallel that 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 the pattern of that solution if we were to parallel that into organizations today so we know that organizations are you know supporting a lot of projects if you're a mid-size or large company you may be uh, implementing anywhere from 100 to 250 projects a year we were talking about how how can you leverage a network within an organization to solve to solve a problem to bring about awareness of a of a change um, having an analytical mindset uh, we also talked about engagement, employee engagement. So a lot of organizations send out a quarterly survey or an annual survey to measure employee engagement. Uh, but when you, when you look at what that means, it's really a lagging indicator. So if you're a leader and you get, or it, even if you're a change manager and practitioner, you do a, a readiness assessment, right? The results of that assessment, it, it, it's a lagging indicator. If, if, the, if the results come back, um, in a poor way, then there's, there's really nothing you can do. Um, do you want to share your thoughts about how, how our interactions within the workplace are really learning opportunities? And, and, and what, are some, what are some leading indicators that we can kind of pay attention to in the workplace to, to solve our issues? I do remember that. I was thinking those would make for excellent survey questions. Because if you mm -hmm. have a specific change, and let's say you're doing an organizational wide change, so you need to convince a whole lot of individuals that they need to make this change. And I know that the tipping point is 70%, that your, your project is going to fail unless you get 70% of the individuals on board with the change and participating and embracing it. And I know the change is really hard because most people mm -hmm. are comfortable, even if, if the way that the status quo is miserable, it's still familiar. And it's still less stressful to stick with what's familiar than it is to do something that's completely different. So it's hard to convince people to do something that's different. But we were looking at, with a readiness survey, if you're getting that attitudinal feedback about who's willing to make the change and who's on the fence and who's resistant, I think that's a great way of identifying the people who could become your change champions. And those are the people that you train up first and you get them to talk to others about their experience so that they can start encouraging people at the ground level. Because while the change has to be driven from the top down, the people who are in the trenches are the ones who are actually doing the actions that you need to be different with an organization. Mm -hmm. So knowing who your, your champions would be is a great way to get that, that extra support from your early adopters. So, um, 
we were looking at adding survey questions to it. So you get a sense of who do I learn from? And if, you, if your company is too large to have specific names to build this network, then maybe back it up to teams. So if I have one friend in finance and one friend in the IT department and 15 friends on the sales team, then maybe I've got a different type of connection than um, someone else who's got a different collection of friends. And the neat thing is if you can identify who your more influential people are within the teams where you need to start, now you can help identify who your champions are with the survey. So even just by giving a quantity of the number of people that they are friends, friends with, or people who do you learn from, because maybe we're not buddies, maybe we're not friends and we're not gonna go after, go out and do something outside of work together, but yeah. maybe I really respect you. And if you say to do something differently, I'll, I'll give it more careful consideration or a more open attitude than with this guy who I know doesn't know what he's talking about. And then who learns from me? You know, I, in my current organization, I'm not, I'm not actually a teacher, but I'm conducting um, a series of small informal classes on expert level Excel functionality. And I'm building the skills of a team through this. So I'm becoming an influencer just because I'm teaching software class folks. And so if I have an idea for a change, they'll probably listen to me more carefully now than they would six months ago when they barely knew me. So it's also a moving yeah. target. If you're going to do this kind of survey now, you're going to have different answers six months from now. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a, I think it's a, a new nugget, if you will, um, because we, I, a lot of practitioners don't really think that way when we're implementing, implementing projects, but identifying people who have strong relationships across uh, different businesses, that that's a great way to identify early adopters. Um, something else we were talking about when, when implementing a, a survey, um, you really want to understand the state of mind of, of people. Can you elaborate on that concept? Well, people's loyalties towards your organization are going to change over time. I know that a lot of times when I've left an organization, it's because my manager has changed. My immediate supervisor is different now than when I started. And it's usually when I don't necessarily care for or mesh with that new person that suddenly my loyalty to the company gets broken. So if, if my organization wants me to do a change and maybe I'm not really thrilled about the extra work it's going to take to make this happen, if I really like my immediate supervisor, chances are I'll give it a try, even though I'm not, I don't care for the sake of the organization, but I care for the relationship with the supervisor. Or sometimes it's the other way around. I've had an immediate supervisor I didn't like at all, but I really, really liked the vice president of our division who I'd also done some work for. And so I was willing to stick it out for the organization and try something the organization needed, even though I could, couldn't care less if my boss liked it or not. So yeah, yeah, those, yeah. those kinds of relationships matter because it isn't, just, it isn't just people who are machines that are filling some role. You've got a very human element with likes and dislikes and getting along together. I think the social networking side of it's actually really important. Yeah. Now, our organizations have a ton of data flowing through it. Um, how can practitioners leverage existing data that's already kind of accessible today? How can they leverage that data to, 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 to work more predictive, to kind of you know, forecast things or forecast outcomes? It's putting things together. So you may have a wealth of data, say, in your sales team or maybe a customer relationship team, but it's also pairing it up with other things. So thinking of like uh, sort of timelines of things when you have a major change yeah. in, or like this is the point in time where we got a new version of the software, then everything went downhill from there or started getting better. Combining data from different sources is the thing. And that's a lot of times it's a cross-functional activity. So you tend to yeah. have silos of data. Here's my CRM, here's my supply chain management software, here's my accounting software. And it's when you can put the things together and then you can start seeing some interactions like, oh, when we appointed that new vice president over this team, actually that's when we started seeing a change over here in this unrelated chain. And those things touch each other and they're not obvious until you can start combining data from lots of different sources. No, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for, for offering that. So without being too technical, it, what, um, what, what formula would people use to, to be able to connect different sources of data and actually draw insights from it? Is, is there a certain 
type of um, calculation or formula that comes to mind? That's the hard part. There isn't a particular one that comes to mind. It's a case by case basis. I mean, okay. if you've got a really small organization where your data is more accessible, a lot of times your big challenge is getting it into a format that you can use. Oh wait, that's not just small, that's actually large. Okay, that's everybody. Everybody has messy data. And that's the hardest mm -hmm. part. Where you've got a lot of data that's actually kept in spreadsheets on individual people's computers, and it's not out there in yeah. a simplification for people to get to. You might hear the buzz phrase democratizing data, but that's what democratizing data is about. It's moving data away from individual little silos and putting it to a place where everyone can get to. And yeah. that depends on the size of your organization and the budget you have for these kinds of things. And in some cases, it doesn't necessarily make sense to have an expensive person on staff who's a data scientist. Um, maybe it makes more sense to outsource something on a project basis. Small wins are the way to go. So you find something that's a huge pain point that really matters that can impact a lot of things and you make a change Prove how much money you save from doing that change and then leverage that to do more changes. That's the general yeah, no. strategy for how to bring analytics into your organization. Awesome. No, thanks. Thanks, Angela. What's the one or two things you would like um, our community members to, to walk away from this conversation as it pertains to predictive analytics or having an analytics mindset? Having an analytics mindset is about exploring and the curiosity and the not taking things for granted. And so it's also smart to, to look at your data in ways, how can I blend it? So it's not just, I have all these people and they're on a team, but if you think of them as a portfolio of assets, like there are a bunch of stocks and equities in a portfolio and the portfolio performance is something, it's a different perspective. And you might mm -hmm. make decisions based on viewing your staff as portfolios of assets. So it's, it's challenging your assumptions and the way things have been done historically. And the tough thing about analytics is people don't wanna trust a computer to make decisions for them. And that's understandable. Computers make mistakes or computers are too rigid, not flexible enough with their thinking. But the idea is that analytics are meant to be a partner to your experience. They're not meant to replace it. So if yeah. your analytical model tells you the best thing to do is to put on a blindfold and drive highway speeds at night in a snowstorm, is that what you should do? No, no, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Well, Angela, listen, thank you so much for participating in this webcast and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you.